Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Um, this video is a continuation into the ongoing discussion into human rights. I'm changing gears, however. Uh, in the last section, I, I gave a, a, rather, a rather substantial account, I think, of the ongoing conflict between human rights and the expansion of global capitalism. I'm completely going to switch gears now, and I'm going to talk about the conflict between human rights and torture. We remember, we remember from the maybe the first hour or two hours of the lecture series that I discussed the freedom from, for example, torture as being a first generation human right. In a sense, this articulation is, conceptually speaking, situated within, to be technical, first generation human rights discourse, right? Because it's a freedom from individual autonomous human beings with a right to self-determination have a right not to be, a right to be free from torture, obviously by those in um, political power and so on. There's more to it than that, but uh, that's going to situate the discourse. The title of the section that I'll be doing is called Torture in the Future. Um, it covers page 82 to 93 out of Human Rights in the World Community. So we'll be using this text. Again, uh, the title of the article that I'm going to be analyzing is Torture in the Future. Again, all of the um, accounts, the entire lecture series, comes from this one book. So for me, it's an insane resource. It's an extremely valuable resource, lots of secondary information, lots of references to other authors, other con concepts, lots of references to primary um, research to help facilitate an understanding of human rights. Um, as some of you know, some of you might not, um, I started and created an NGO, non-governmental organization called IGAR, the Institute for Genocide Awareness and Applied Research, and I established uh, an advisory board of the greatest genocide scholars in the world. And um, I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of work uh, in, with the NGO in communities throughout the U.S. and, and the world. And I'm going to do more work. but. Uh, for me, it's busy, 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 busy. I have my regular job, uh, and then I have this addiction to YouTube, uh, and my NGO is, is a pretty substantial force. It's only going to get bigger and more powerful with time, but as all things, I have to nurture it slowly. Um, I was connected with, she used to work for the Florida Center for Survivors of Torture. Her name is Abigail Alexander, and she and I have co-facilitated um, discussions um, on torture and the relationship between genocide and torture and survivors of torture. Um, IGAR has worked with Amnesty, we've worked with Amnesty International. Uh, Amnesty International, I uh, was at University of Miami and did a co-facilitation with torture survivors, uh, with many, many other NGOs, um, and the Florida Gulf Coast, uh, what was the Flor Florida, Florida um, Center for Survivors Survivors of Torture, and IGAR, the Institute for Genocide Awareness, which, which I created, we've done a lot already with torture. So the, 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 thing, the reason why I say that is not necessarily to brag. I have no reason to do that, though bragging is not a bad thing because I'm in the chain. But um, the reason for saying that is that it, you're not getting a lecture from a guy who's just lecturing for the sake of being seen. All right? You know, as I always say, judge me by my actions, judge me by my works. IGAR, very young organization, it's been around since 2009, it's 2011. But in two years, we've done a lot. We've done a lot to help make the world a better place. And I think one of the things that we can, that we can be passionate about and make sense of is overwhelmingly uh, a rejection of torture. Torture as a human rights violation should not be acceptable. Uh, and we have to make sure that we are always cognizant of the abuse of political, primarily, power um, and the use of torture as a vehicle for investigation, you know, preserving political power, what have you. Um, it's really general at that level. It's far more complicated. And I've devoted uh, quite a bit of this lecture series on assessing um, the relationship between torture and the human right to be free from, in a first generational sense, from torture. So with that, let's begin, um, let's begin. So this is human rights in 
this is section 5. Torture and human rights. Okay, so uh, let's begin with a quote. Quote, there is a popular belief that Western history constitutes a progressive, more, a progression, more from, uh, a pro, uh, sorry, 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 let me restart over. There is a popular belief that Western history constitutes a progressive move from more to less torture, right? So that um, as Western history um, historically moves f closer and closer to the present, then we also decrease the levels of torture, right? So that the levels of torture decrease as we increase um, in time, right? As we get more to the present, um, levels of torture stop. And basically, to keep it simple, all that really just means is, listen, um, we used to use Iron Maidens, and we used to use um, water tortures, and all types of bizarre, horrible um, methods of extracting um, confessions as a means of interrogation, but as we become more quote-unquote civilized, I hate the word civilized, but as we become more civilized, we as a Western community have relinquished those, right? So there's, there's this popular belief that Western history constitutes a progressive move from, away from, a lot of torture and embracing less torture and absolutely no torture, right? So uh, the next point, obviously we know that that's problematic after all of you know about Abu Ghraib, we'll talk about that now in a bit, but um, torture, quote, this is a quote from the same book, um, page 83, torture must be practiced in secret and denied in public, right? So in public, you have to put on the game face, right? And you say, absolutely under no circumstances should you legitimize the use of torture. Torture is something that we might, in the history of Western um, tradition, have practiced in the past, but in no sense is it something that we should condone today, because it's an abuse of human rights um, violations. It is um, a refusal to recognize, to be technical, first generation human rights. It is to use an individual human being as a means to information, rather than an end in and of, in and of him or herself. Torture is a horrendous act. You say that publicly, then you put on a real face, you go behind closed doors, and you torture somebody. You might have to legitimize it to yourself if you're the particular torturer to say, well, he deserves it or he's bad. Or you might just be a person who's uncaring is like, I was told to torture him and this is what I'm going to do. Nevertheless, publicly, you renounce it. Privately, you practice it. And that's the quote, right? So torture must be practiced in secret and denied outright in public. I thought that was a great line. So basically, the question is, what is torture? Quote, torture refers to the purposeful harming of someone who is in the custody, right? The emphasis is going to, from here on out, be on custody. C-U-S-T. Custody is going to be very important, right? When you think of torture, you primarily think that torture is only ever possible with respect to the use of torture as an a tactic within interrogation by a political establishment. While that is true, it's not the fact that it's the political establishment that makes it torture. Really what makes it torture, as we'll see in a little bit, is custody, right? So that custody becomes the seminal condition that has to be met in order for us to really talk about torture um, on an international sort of legal sense. Um, and also conceptually, I'm a conceptual theorist, so conceptually, um, the condition that has to be satisfied in order for us to have a discourse on torture is the notion of custody, right? So, torture refers to purposefully harming someone who is in custody, unfree to fight back or protect himself or herself, and imperiled by that incapacitation. The individual it has been um, incarcerated, incapacitated, or both, insofar as the individual is, in, is incorporated and incapacitated held within custody, and we have to legitimize what custody means in a second, 